thanks for joining me on Too Hot for Radio. I am joined today on the line with Andrew Boyd, who's a spokesperson uh, for Release International. Hi there, Andrew. Hi, good to talk to you. Now, it's been a while, isn't it? I used to interview you um, fairly regularly when I worked for, for Transworld Radio about kind of up-to-date issues to do with persecution, but thought it would be useful to kind of talk to you about just persecution in general. Uh, anyone who's read their Bible can see that there was uh, a good amount of persecution in the early church. So right now, 2020, how does that compare? Are we in a, is this a bad season for Christians generally, or is this, uh, is it better than it has been in the past? Do you know, it's one of those funny things, isn't it? The worse persecution gets, the more the church grows. Mm. <laughs> it's just, it's just one of those strange things. And Jesus promised that there would be persecution. He said, they've, they've hated me, they're going to hate you too. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. But the church grows as a result of it. Our response to it, as those who are enjoying fresh breath of freedom, is to make the best use we can of our freedom, but also to speak up for those who are being persecuted. Persecution will always be with us, but we need to show compassion. We need to show care for people. We need to stand up for them. Proverbs 31.8 says, be a voice for those who have no voice. Speak up for the poor and needy. And Hebrews 13.3 says, remember those who are in prison as though you yourself were suffering. So how is it now? It's pretty darn difficult, actually. All of the indicators of persecution are rising and have been for a number of years. So uh, some estimate that there are something like 260 million people now, who Christians, who are living in countries where they're persecuted. And the recent report by the Bishop of Truro, which was commissioned by the UK Foreign Office, found that Christians are the most persecuted religious minority, where they're in a minority, around the world. 80% of those who are persecuted for their faith are Christians, which is really quite extraordinary. It is indeed. I think you, uh, Release International, often kind of highlight some of the most dangerous places in the world to be a Christian. Could you kind of go through uh, some of them? My understanding is I think North Korea seems to often top the bill, but what other countries are are kind of the the most anti-Christian in terms of, I guess, the, the government and uh, the way it works out in day-to-day -day life? Yes, North Korea always seems to be up there. That There's a lack of accurate information from North Korea for really very obvious reasons. There aren't that many people in there to tell us what is going on. But Christians in North Korea can be rounded up to three generations. So, for instance, if, if you were caught praying in your home with a Bible there, there's a chance that you might be put into a detention center along with your children and your parents. I mean, this is quite extraordinary. It's that tough. And, and these detention centers are not spick and span modern prisons. They've been likened to concentration camps. Mm. So North Korea is, is absolutely extreme. But there are other nations which are very much emerging as places of particular concern. And one concern of mine, I've just been writing about it for Release International, is China. It's extraordinary watching what is happening in China. And right now, of course, the whole world is going through the whole coronavirus thing. But we need to remember that the doctor who raised the alarm about the coronavirus was told to shut up by the police. And he's died, of course, as a result of the coronavirus. But he was considered to be rocking the boat in China and uh, giving succor, if you like, to China's enemies. And this is exactly what happens to Christians within China. There are human rights lawyers in China, and I've interviewed some. I've had the privilege of being in China speaking to these incredibly brave and very ordinary men who have been attempting to defend churches where the authorities have been ripping down the crosses from those churches. If you can imagine if that happening in this country, that somebody comes along, looks at the cross on the top of your church and says, oh, that's a real hazard for health and safety. We need to tear that down. And you think, hang on a minute. Buddy, it's been up there for years and it's not troubling anybody. So these lawyers have gone to court using the laws of the land to defend the Christians' rights to have a cross on their church. There have been, these lawyers have disappeared. 
some of them have been tortured, some of them have been forced into making public confessions on state television that they're enemies of the state. And the real question is, what kind of a country does that to its human rights lawyers? Well, the same kind of a country that does that to its doctors who are saying there is a problem with coronavirus. So we're seeing right the way across China a real upsurge in persecution, both of the official state registered church, the restrictions that are coming on those churches that are unendurable, and of course the underground church where people say, well, we, we have to worship, we, we're believers. If you had a prayer meeting in your home, if you were living in China, and the authorities find out about it, they'll put pressure on your landlord, if you're renting, to throw you out of your home. And much, much worse can happen. So China is, is a country of growing concern. There are others too. Mm. And it's interesting, I was reading a book by Leonard Ravenhill recently, Why Revival Tarries, and he had put in uh, one of his articles in in that book, he'd said, he was kind of lamenting about how the gospel didn't seem to have taken root in China. Uh, I think the book's about 30 years, 35 years old now. And I was struck by, I'm sure I'd heard figures that said that we are yeah. at this point, the kind of there are more Christians now in, in China than there are in America. And so I think it's right what you said, isn't it? That there is there is an incredible growth in China despite a very difficult situation. So where, where persecution is, often the gospel seems to flourish. Yes, it does. If we just put those figures in China into some kind of context, it's now considered widely that there are more Christians in China than members of the Communist Party, which of course worries the Communist Party. And US-based research by Pew, the Pew Research Center, nothing to do with pews in churches, reckons that by 2030, China will be the most Christianized nation on Earth. It will have more churchgoers wow. than any other country incredible. on Earth. So we're seeing an incredible revival of Christian faith within China, an incredible spread. And I think when you're faced with really life and death issues, what is life about? Why are we here? You know, these huge questions. And you're faced with that, and you're faced with the possibility of losing absolutely everything if you pursue your faith. It brings things really very much to a head. And you know, I'm just reminded, um, Jesus, who, who was so provocative at times. <laughs> you look for gentle Jesus, meek and mild when you read the Gospels, and quite often what comes over is quite different. There's one point where Jesus is provoking his disciples to try and, try and really test their mettle, and he says to them, look, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you've got no part in me. Now, these are Jews. You don't drink blood. What, what are we saying here? And, and a third of them leave him. They think, I don't understand him. I don't know what he's talking about. This is far too radical. A third of them get up and go. So Jesus looks at Peter. You can just imagine the look in his eye and says, well, what about you? And Peter says, well, I mean, I think the subtext of what Peter says is, I do not know what you're on, Lord, but you are Lord. And where else am I going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. So yeah. they stayed. And I think in contexts like China, where people are really having to make the hard choices about why they're living and what they're living for and what they're going to do with their lives, uh, it makes an enormous difference. Can I tell you the story of one of these lawyers that I met? Because yeah, he yeah. really impressed me. His name was Jiang Cheng Yong, and he was slightly dumpy, slightly podgy guy in his late 30s, early 40s. I saw him with another lawyer, uh, a guy called Zhang Kai. And Jiang... Jiang, from an early age, felt a call on his life to defend the poor, speak up for the poor. And this is a guy who was not a Christian. But the, he realized that within China, if you're going to do that, you're going to be very unpopular. So because of this call on this, his life that this non-Christian lawyer felt, he decided to become a Christian. And he wanted the real deal, so he joined the underground church, gave his life thoroughly to Christ. I interviewed him in a hotel uh, in secret in China. And I asked him, are you concerned at all about what could happen to you? And this guy, well, he burst into tears, actually. He took himself off to the bathroom for a bit, composed himself. And he came back and he said, 
it's inevitable. What, what will happen to me is just inevitable. But I am determined to pursue what is the calling on my life and to pursue God. Now, two weeks later, it was the Arab Spring. It was a time when China was concerned the revolution might even spread to its own streets. Two weeks later, he was arrested. This guy was disappeared. He vanished without trace. No legal representation. He's put into what's known as a black prison. That's a prison that's not on the map. It's not official. You just vanish. He was given the whole treatment out there, and he knows what that means because he's defended people who've gone through all of that. And he was forced to make a public confession on state television. The guy has been released, and by release, that means that he's now under house arrest, effectively. He's under constant surveillance. He has no freedom whatsoever. That's the real cost of pursuing Christian faith within a country like China. It's very, very real. And it's incredibly humbling when you meet these people because it just makes you wonder what you're doing with your life. I was looking in my Bible recently and saw that it had been printed in China. Uh, and it seems that a lot of Bibles uh, are kind of produced in China. What, what do the government think about that? You know, if they are nervous of, of, of uh, Christianity or, or is it if they're just thinking, well, if it's just to be exported, it doesn't matter, it's still business. So have you ever thought about that before? And, and, and what do you think about Bible companies using China to produce Bibles? Uh, should we not be doing that because we know that the, the government there uh, is clamping down on Christians very often? Well, the, the production of Bibles in China really is a very interesting one. There is a company called Amity within China, which is pr printing loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of Bibles, as the government in China will readily tell you. Loads of Bibles are being printed in China. It's just trying to get hold of one. They're very tightly controlled in the way that they're distributed within China. And what it does is it gives the government the ability to say, look, we're printing Bibles. Have a look at the video of the factory. Come mm. out and have a look at it. Yep. We're printing millions of Bibles for China. But the demand within China is absolutely not being satisfied by the production of those Bibles. And it's very, very difficult to get hold of Christian literature in China. And so for Christians within that country, they're faced with the dilemma, do we submit to an atheist State, and that, that China is officially atheist, it's communist and it's atheist, who insist on being head of the church. If we come under their registration, they'll appoint our pastors, they'll determine what we can and can't preach, they'll forbid us from taking our children to church. We can't do that. Anybody under the age, age, age of 18, you can't go to church. Wow, okay. Didn't they'll, realize that. Yeah, it's absolutely extreme. In the, and it's getting tougher. So in 2018, they introduced a whole set of tough new legislation. And last, this February, they've stepped it up yet again. And what's happened is that they've made the local Communist Party officials responsible for enforcing all of this. And some of them are doing it with, a, with great zeal, as you might imagine. So in some cases, I talked about crosses being torn down. Churches are being torn down. Religious symbols within churches, even murals on walls, religious murals on walls are being ripped down by the authorities. If you want to, and, and the whole coronavirus thing is put into sharp relief because churches in Wuhan were trying to distribute face masks. The face masks have been given to them from overseas supporters. Now, these tough new rules that China's just introduced say you can't have overseas support for your Christian faith without state approval. So when, <laughs> when the Christians in Wuhan are trying to distribute the face masks, the authorities are seizing them. And then there's this wonderful Chinese euphemism, inviting to tea. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Inviting to tea those who are distributing the face masks. It isn't nice. It's interrogation that they're facing. But it's that kind of level of day-to-day, -day, uh, what they, they call it in China, sinicization, and it actually means making the church more Chinese. So that's pulling down the crosses, getting rid of the religious symbols, forcing you, removing some of the Christian hymns, forcing you to sing party anthems, <laughs> um, using face recognition software on members of the congregation to find out who's going in and out of church. It's all in incredibly George Orwell's 1984, but with modern technology. So China is, is a place of, of real worry, but there are other places too. For instance, India, 
persecution is getting far, far worse for Christians in India. And the reason for that is something called Hindutva, which is the nationalistic belief that if you are Indian, you need to be a Hindu and nothing else will be tolerated. And most of us would have seen something of this. If you've seen the film Slumdog Millionaire, you'll see from a Muslim perspective where Hindus have attacked Muslims in India. It's a very realistic representation of what's happening to Muslims and to Christians within India. And the number of attacks against Christians in that country has absolutely gone through the roof. Hmm. There was hope, wasn't there, when Narendra Modi took over, that there would be a kind of reduction. Our country, at least, was was fairly hopeful, but it seems like that actually hasn't panned out. And, And I guess that that leaves us often with the question of of how much our government, which, you know, obviously, um, whatever you feel about the Conservative Party and, and Boris Johnson in place, they were, as far as I can see, really the only party that mentioned Christian freedom and wanting to, to promote that uh, in the country. Um, the, it often leaves the question, doesn't it, of how involved our government should be with other governments that we know are committing human rights abuses against Christians. Um, but there, there was quite a lot of hope, I remember, when the new Prime Minister took over in, in India, and it, it doesn't seem to have materialised the way we had wanted. Well, I guess it depends on, on what you were reading. Certainly at Release International, he represents the BJP, which is a nationalist party. We were not hopeful. Right. That things would get better in India. We imagined mm. they'd get worse, and they've got a lot worse. But it, coming back to the point that you made about government engagement, there's, there is some really good news here, and there has been a sea change in the way the government is engaging with issues of persecution. And it was under Jeremy Hunt as foreign secretary. Jeremy Hunt declares himself to be a Christian. He commissioned research from the Bishop of Truro, which organizations like Release International and others uh, contributed to, to look into what should be the British government's response to Christian persecution. That report by the Bishop of Truro, as I mentioned earlier, found that 80% of those who are persecuted around the world for their faith are Christians. Extraordinary figure, and there are lots of other figures within there too. But it called for a total change in the way governments dealt with it. And when you've been involved in trade negotiations or giving out aid, if you approach a government and say, look, we're not happy with the human rights record, what they would tend to say is that's got nothing whatsoever to do with it. That's not on the table. It's not up for discussion. We're not talking about it. The difference now is that it absolutely is linked with the giving of aid and the uh, arranging of trade so that countries cannot kick this stuff off the table. And what we've done, uh, and it really is to be welcomed and commended, is following the footsteps of the United States. The U.S. State Department has regularly produced reports identifying countries that are of particular concern, particularly uh, to do with their human rights records. And it's linked that with the ability of the states to actually impose sanctions on those nations. And this acceptance in full of every measure within the Truro report, which the government has done, has totally accepted it, gives the UK the possibility of imposing sanctions against nations. It's an incredibly big stick with which, well, hopefully you never have to beat anybody with a stick, just having one, as somebody once said, speak quietly and carry a big stick. It means that you have the clout to tell countries, I'm sorry, you have to address these issues. You have to address the issues of the way you are denying basic freedoms, the most basic freedom of all, freedom of belief to your own people. That's really good news. When I was doing more programs on this, I remember there were maybe three or four kind of quite high profile Christians that were uh, in jail at the time, and uh, definitely the most famous of those was was Asiya Bibi. Um, and so my understanding now is that she has been released. I think she's living uh, in Canada. A number of people had been released, these more kind of high-profile people, one from Iran, there was one in uh, China. It seems like there are less like individuals. You know, you can talk about the numbers of Christians who have been uh, arrested, but sometimes having been out of focus on a specific person, uh, knowing their name and, and being able to pray for them specifically. Are there less well-known other, you know, kind of people right now? So the numbers might be bigger, but in terms of high profile, I wonder if there are less that we kind of know of specifically. Do you think that's right or not? 
I think that's probably fair. You know, if you think back to the Asya Bibi story, if you wanted to kind of summarize what was going on in Pakistan and is still going on in Pakistan, you'd, you'd point to Asya Bibi, uh, an ordinary, uneducated farm laborer who was out working in the fields and her colleagues were, were Muslims. And there's quite a lot of bantering and a bit of bickering that goes on. She went to fetch them some water. And they said, well, we're not drinking that. You're a Christian. It's unclean. We can't drink that. And they got into an argument, and she was accused of blasphemy, which, of course, the Supreme Court many, many, many years later denounced all of that as totally fabricated, completely trumped up charges. But she'd spent something like 10 years in jail, at Mm. least eight years on death row, before eventually... If you can remember the the furore on the streets of Pakistan, people carrying banners saying "Hang Asia." They brought the city to this, many cities to a standstill. They threatened revolution. They threatened to overturn the government. And politicians in Pakistan who've spoken out about blasphemy have been assassinated for even daring to say, "Perhaps we should look at this again." That itself is considered to be blasphemous. So. When you compare the incredible high-profile high nature of Asya Bibi's case with, with what else is going on, the other stories are not that well known, but one of the things that Release International tries very hard to do is to connect us, connect you and me, connect ordinary Christians in the UK with ordinary Christians in the world who are facing persecution. And we need to... We need to look them in the eye. We need to hear their hearts, listen to their stories, understand them in order to have any kind of uh, sympathy for what's gone on, because otherwise the issues are just simply too big. But I think you're right that there aren't that many high profile individual cases, but there are probably more cases of people whose stories are not well known who are persecuted today. Mm. So you've mentioned in our time so far North Korea, China, India, uh, Pakistan. Are there any stories right now that you think we need to hear about that maybe we're not aware of? I think we, we need to look at what is going on in the Middle East. Obviously, we tend to think of ISIS and uh, we think of Iraq there. Well, just to put Iraq into some kind of context, it wasn't that long ago that there was 1.3 million Christians living in Iraq. Today, there's about a quarter of a million, maybe 300,000, and that number is declining, and many of them are trying to get asylum in the West, and they're being denied it. There's been an enormous exodus of Christians from Iraq. I've been over there a few times. I've met people who've been driven from their homes time after time after time. They've been driven out. They've come back. They've been driven out again. They've come back, and they've had enough of that place. So what we're seeing is the removal of the Christian presence from the Middle East. And it's as a result of all kinds of turmoil, including the work of Islamic State. But if we just go to a neighbor of Iraq now and we look at Iran, we're also seeing an exodus of Christians from Iran. And the context here is a little bit different. Iran is an Islamic nation. That's what it is, and that's what it does, and that's what it expects of its of its civilians. So the Iranians have been working now for years to try to completely eliminate the Persian-speaking church within that country. Many Christians have left. It's been a national clampdown that's been going on. Church leaders have been driven overseas. The restrictions in Iran are getting worse. But once again, the good news is that uh, there is quite a spread of Christianity among Iranians wherever they live. God is doing something quite remarkable. And across the Middle East, Release International and others have been hearing stories repeatedly of Muslim refugees who've encountered Christ without any human intervention. I've spoken to people who've been fleeing their country who've had dreams and visions of Christ. They've not understood what they've been seeing. They've seen a cross and they've seen a man. And this man is just extraordinary. And he says to them, it's all right, I'll be with you. And the most remarkable story, I'm getting excited about this now. The most remarkable one I heard recently was of a refugee who had a vision of Christ coming from Syria. And this refugee was, was, was on their way to a bill. I can't remember if it's a man or a woman. I said it's a man. And, um, and in this vision of Christ, 
Christ said to him, go to Erbil, that's the capital of Kurdistan, that's northern Iraq, go to a particular street in Erbil, go to this particular house number, and that was where the vision ended. Now, they were fleeing to Erbil, which is a safe haven for Christians. Remember, this is a Muslim we're talking about here, but Erbil has been a safe haven for Christians within the Middle East, probably the only one, and did exactly that. Went to the town, went to the road, went to the house, knocked on the door, not knowing what on earth they would find. And the person who opened the door was a Christian missionary who's working with Release International's partner in Kurdistan, who was able to tell them the gospel uh, and tell them about this Christ that had already appeared to them in a dream. Wow. That's not unusual now. We're hearing this again and again and again. God is on the move, and there are Muslims who are who Christ is meeting, and then they're fleeing to places like Lebanon. They're seeing the crosses on the church and saying, that's what I saw in my dream. Tell me about this. <laughs> and they're being led to Christ. It's incredible. I mean, yeah, I, I've heard some similar stories of that. And we, um, the church that I attend, uh, we've got about uh, maybe a dozen uh, men from Iran, a few women as well, wow. who've been fleeing, and uh, we've been starting a Bible study with them. And uh, incredible! Uh, and uh, there's a church in Liverpool that seems to be uh, just to have um, many, many Iranians coming. And so it does seem that God is doing something amongst them. It, it is always fairly controversial, isn't it? And I wonder if, if yourself or Release International, do you have a stance in terms of? immigration so people wanting to come to this country fleeing persecution is your stance that that we should have open doors to anyone uh who would who would say from anywhere in the world that you know i'm being persecuted because of my faith it's a controversial topic and i know it gets into kind of politics and policies and things like that is there a stance from release international on that not a blanket one but in terms of asia bibi for example she was not offered asylum in the UK, and the laws are slightly complicated, and, and we regretted that, actually, but the laws are slightly complicated because you need to ask for asylum. It can't be offered to you. That seems to be the mm. way it works, and she apparently didn't ask for it. I mean, she may not be in Canada forever, but we regarded it as regrettable that she's stuck in Pakistan or was stuck in Pakistan for so long. Nobody was offering to, to help her or look after her. Of course, in the end, the Canadians did. But if we go back to Iran, for example, many Iranian Christians and Iraqis as well are applying for asylum to the West. But the Iranian Christians, most of them have been refused. Some mm. of them have been waiting for eight years now in Turkey to try to get asylum to the West. And there needs to be, with all politics, <laughs> it's politics is the art of the possible. And yes, it's about compromises. What, what can you succeed in doing? But the Christian gospel is about compassion as well. And it's about other things too, but it's about compassion. And there is a real need for compassion. And I remember being yeah. in Iraq talking to a Christian priest. I can't remember what faith he was. Now it doesn't really matter. But it was an area where Islamic State... Um, was soon to take it over, actually. It was just north of Mosul. And he was furious. He was furious with the UK. He said, why are you allowing in so many Muslim terrorists? This is his words, not mine. Hmm. So many Muslim terrorists in the UK. These are people who are known to be troublemakers. You open your doors to them. But when Christians from Iraq try to get into the UK, you won't let them. Why is that? I don't have an answer for that. But, I, but what we would say to it is, I know it's complicated. I know there are difficulties in all of this, but we have to have compassion at our core and we have to have righteousness at the heart of our nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, the Bible tells us. And if we deal with others unrighteously, we will reap what we sow. So it's so important to, yes, weigh it up in the balance, but there is a need for mercy, there is a need for compassion, and there is always a need for righteousness. And the interesting thing about that word righteousness, David in Psalm 23 says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It comes from an old English word. I don't use it anymore. The word was right wiseness. So you can imagine that with a West Country accent. Right wiseness <laughs> becomes righteousness. And it means literally not just right standing with God, but right walking before God, walk before me, God says, and be blameless. 
And it means when you've got a real dilemma, like how many people do you let into your country? For example, where do you stop? Where do you draw the line? It's at that point that you need to be guided in paths of righteousness mm. for his name's sake. Absolutely. But we're, gl- we're glad to see that the whole issue of Christian persecution is heart and center now of British government policy. This is this is really significant. It really is a sea change. Finally, then, there will be a number of charities that point out how difficult it is becoming for Christians, uh, particularly, you know, would hold to the, the biblical stance on marriage and sexuality and all those kind of issues. And people talk about Christians being marginalised in this country. And I've definitely heard the word persecution used now and again. Is that the right word to use? Or do you think that kind of downplays then the genuine persecution of kind of arrests and imprisonment and stuff? And I, I guess there are street preachers that have been arrested. And it just, I, I don't know if you put it on the same would you would you use the same word basically? No, I think about our colleagues, the Christians I've met in Egypt, for example. Now, Egypt, I would say, and I think most of us would look at it and say there is a lot of persecution of Christians in Egypt. People are beaten, they're killed, not not all the time, and not regularly, but it goes on in Egypt. They don't talk about persecution; they talk about pressure. They feel a sense of pressure um, because they have. Their background is Coptic Christianity. It's unusual. You know, it's not our either Protestant or Catholic view here. Mm. They have a, a, a theology of martyrdom within Egypt, which says, well, this is the normal Christian life, folks. It doesn't stop you being a Christian. In fact, it should encourage you to live for God, the fact that you're under a degree of pressure. There may be increasing pressure in the UK because our culture is moving on. So where Christians will say, hang on, the Word of God says one thing and our culture says another, what are we going to do? Are we going to conform to our culture or are we going to stick with the Word of God, even if it's awkward to do that? And I know that we're, we're all over the place on this one, the church, but it's inevitable that you begin to get increasingly out of step with your culture if you stick with the Word of God. And so pressure begins to come to bear. But what I've learned over the years speaking to Christians who've been persecuted, having had the privilege of going to their countries, seeing what they've gone through. I mean, I remember standing in a burnt-out church in Nigeria with heavy metal doors on this church, which were cut through and scored where the cutlasses had been used against them. This is before the days of Boko Haram. And the, the pastor there, who was a brethren minister, This mob had tried to kill him, but God had delivered him. It was amazing. His radiant faith was incredible. And I realized from talking to people like that, that, well, you don't, there's no, we don't fear persecution. We're called to fear God because that's the beginning of wisdom. And that Mm. means to honor him and hold him in awe. We're also, we need to recognize that life is not a gift. It's a trust. And we're accountable for what we do with our lives. Yeah. We have freedom here, and we don't even know it. We don't notice it any more than the air that we breathe. If the air was in short supply, we'd soon know it. We'd be gasping. But Christians around the world are leading the normal Christian life in an atmosphere where their freedom is very, very thin, like very thin air, and they're learning to make the very best of it. And I think that as Christians here in the UK, given the freedom we have and the responsibility we have to use that freedom well, really need, really need to decide who we're going to live for and why. I had um, the privilege recently of writing the biography of Archbishop Benjamin Kwashi from Joss in Nigeria. Mm. It's called Neither Bomb Nor Bullet, but Ben is an amazing man. Three times people have tried to kill him. And each time, (laughs) this man has this huge laugh, this huge smile, this enormous joy. And he says, look, if our faith is worth living for, it's certainly worth dying for. Let's just get on with today. Let's make the best use that we possibly can of today. And his life is so incredibly fruitful. It, uh, I look at mine in comparison with people like Benjamin Kwashi, and you think, my goodness me, if, if that's what persecution does for you and that it really sharpens your focus, then I'm going to stop short of saying, bring it on. But I am going to say, well, I trust you, Lord, whatever will be, 
We will walk with you, we'll serve you, we'll listen to you, and we will speak up for you. And there's a real need in this country for Christians to speak up, to not be ashamed of the gospel, to share their faith openly, to engage intelligently in debate that is happening across the country, and not just wash our hands and say, because it's Pilate who did that. Pilate washed his hands and said, oh, I can't work it out. You sort it out. No, no, no. We need to engage. It's costly. The faith walk is costly, but we need to get stuck into it. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for, for taking some time uh, to join us, Andrew. I think there's kind of concerning things that you've talked about, stuff that's important for us to know, but also seems to be really uh, kind of encouraged as well, encouraged by, by uh, many Christians' faith and the call on us to live a, a radical life for Christ as well. So, Andrew, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it.